Geopolitics and Empire is joined once again by renowned geopolitical analyst Richard Javad Haydarian. His latest book is The Indo-Pacific, Trump, China, and the New Struggle for Global Mastery. Now, I don't always laud a guest's book, but I truly mean it when I say that this is one of the top books on geopolitics to get in 2020, especially if you're interested in the U.S.-China New Cold War and the Indo-Pacific. The book is absolutely densely packed with information, authors, sources, and is written to the point, which I like, easy to read. And so without further ado, thanks for joining Geopolitics and Empire again, Richard. My pleasure, amigo, as always. Now, the context for what you call the new struggle for global mastery is the eagle versus the dragon, or a new global bipolar system pitting uh, Pax Americana against Pax Sinica. So perhaps first we can look at your early chapter on the Trump Doctrine and how the U.S. empire is faring, then move on to the Chinese empire, the rising Chinese empire, and then the Indo-Pacific and wherever else you'd like to take us. In your chapter, you cite an ambassador referring to the Trump presidency as asking, quote, is this how a superpower commits suicide, end quote. And you make the case that Trump is at the helm of a declining hyperpower and that he is accelerating the decline of U.S. influence in Asia, thus serving possibly China. Um, though you also mention later on that in the end, his Nixonian madman approach and hedgehog like leadership has actually turned out not so bad. So can you tell us a little bit about the Trump doctrine and what's going on with uh, Pax Americana? Well, definitely I... Uh... I stand out of the crowd, uh, including among a lot of my colleagues here in Asia, uh, for not taking a straightforwardly negative view of the Trump administration. I think the more or less consensus among experts is that he has been a disaster uh, for the United States and for the broader region, especially smaller countries. Uh, his engagement, especially with Southeast Asia, has been significantly lower than President Obama. Uh, President Obama is the supposed first Pacific president, uh, regularly tried to visit uh, the region. I think he visited majority of the countries in the region, some of them more than once. Uh, and he made sure that their top level uh, representation uh, in most of the uh, major uh, meetings here in the ASEAN. Uh, incidentally, the other week when I was in Washington, DC giving my book talk, uh, Ambassador Campbell, the former ASEAN ambassador, was also there. And she was able to share also her point of view. She was the first among the first amb ambassadors uh, to ASEAN uh, by any major power. Uh, so the Obama administration really made sure to put the Southeast Asian countries on the top of American uh, diplomatic agenda and schedule. But President Trump has been consistently absent. Uh, he didn't even bother to send a cabinet level person. He uh, sent a national security advisor uh, during the latest ASEAN summit. So uh, his no-show, uh, although Obama had no-show, Trump's no-show uh, seems to have uh, sunk in quite a negative way in terms of impression of people. Interestingly, uh, the other year, ICS, Institute for Southeast Studies, uh, released its latest survey of top policymakers and thinkers in the region. Uh, and according to that, uh, more than twice the number of people want China as a leader in this part of the world than the United States. So things are not looking good for the United States. In fact, if you look over the years, it seems the situation is going down. If you look at the Pew survey, for instance, it's under Trump that we see the lowest level of trust in American in an American president to do the right thing. Uh, probably around half of that of President Obama, uh, based on some of the numbers I've seen, and a collapse of between 40 to 70 percent no? uh, among some of the key allies of the United States, like Japan and uh, South Korea, as I mentioned in the book and a lot of my writing. So I think that is more or less the consensus that he has been a disaster. I'm not completely discounting that. And in fact, if you notice in the chapter on the Trump doctrine, I start with this dialogue between Xerxes the Great, the, the Persian uh, emperor, and uh, you know, and his uh, and one of his key advisors. And his key advisors was someone like you could imagine it, a uh, democratic strategist who would say that you know we have to have calibrated approach to everything. We should not throw our weight around all the time. Uh, we should always calculate the um, the implications of everything we do. So you can imagine Obama would think so, something like that. And then Xerxes would say that, you know, if you're scared about every single you're going to do, you're just going to get, you know, you're just going to die of the fear itself. It's better to like go in and risk it all and get something big done. And President Trump's art of the deal, you know, if you look at the major quotes I got from there, extracted from there, almost completely replicates the Xerxes thinking. And of course, we know that eventually Xerxes was proven wrong and big time. And in fact, that uh, marked the beginning of the collapse uh, or long-term decline of the Achaemenid Empire, the first global superpower. And perhaps that could be the case for the United States. 
Uh, interesting, I was watching the DC last week, and we saw that Iran and the United States came almost to blows, right? So around 5.45 p.m., I get messages from family and friends and people in the Middle East and say, do you believe this? You're going to send missiles. So, you know, for the next five and a half hours, I, friends in D.C., every journalist in the town, we were all wondering if there will be any casualty, because I think most of us believe that a single casualty would essentially lead to Trump making attacks within Iran. And the thing is, if it pushed through, and this is still a possibility in the short to medium run, uh, if not in the long run, if Trump gets elected again, uh, re-elected, uh, is that if U.S. gets bogged down in the war with Iran, it will not be a com not only complete humanitarian disaster, and this is not just going to be a, a completely different warfare based on some Rand Corporation study. U.S. may have to de deploy a chunk of its air force to just take care of Iran. That will distract America uh, from Asia, and particularly the China challenge, forget about the Russian challenge, uh, in ways beyond our wildest imagination. So Trump's risk-taking could really be damaging to humanity and also to American geopolitical interests in the region. And the interesting thing is, uh, I remember one of the ambassadors in the Middle East told me a few years ago, he said that in the Middle East, we see America as definitely a threat. Even among allies, you know, America has very low approval ratings, whether you're looking at Turkey, whether you're looking at Egypt or Saudi Arabia. Ironically, I think in Iran, the uh, U.S. had a slightly better rating uh, than allied countries. But in East Asia, actually, United States hegemony is seen in more benign terms as keeping in check the historical hegemony in this part of the world, which is China. And if you look at smaller countries in the region, which, by the way, are not small. I mean, uh, Indonesia is 207 million people. It's among the biggest countries in the world. In fact, if you look at the 15 largest, most populous countries in the world, three of them are from Southeast Asia. Right. And Philippines and Vietnam there. Thailand is even in top 15 based on some of the estimates I've seen. So this is not a region of small countries, but China is just so big that it scares the hell out of a lot of countries. And none of these countries would want their return to the tributary system of Chinese hegemony back in the pre-modern era. Nationalism is strong. The struggle for autonomy is very strong. So the U.S. has not been seen as completely innocent superpower, but as a welcome, much welcome and relatively benign uh, check on China's uh, uh, appetite for return to its uh, hegemonic position in the past. And you can blame China. China is just the biggest. It's the second largest economy in the world. It's the biggest military and economy in this part of the world. It comes almost naturally for them to feel that they're not equal of anyone in this part of the world. So President Trump definitely, you know, if it's a mixed picture uh, over the past few days, it would make me more skeptical. I would say the glass is more uh, empty than full. Nonetheless, the full part is what I wanted to emphasize, which I think is where my analysis stands apart. Because I say, if it's a question of standing up to China, which I think is much necessary, and I think President Obama raised a lot of expectations of pivot to Asia, meaning checking China's ambitions, I think Trump has been able to deliver more on that than on President Obama himself. Yes, withdrawal from TPP in many ways was a disaster, but you know, as a social democrat and left-leaning person, I was not also very excited about TPP. I think top experts like Joseph Stiglitz would tell you that TPP would have been a disaster uh, for the welfare of a lot of countries. It would give, it would have given corporations significant amount of power to actually s uh, circumvent the sovereignty of countries, and it would have intruded into the internet and healthcare infrastructure. So a lot of my friends, including uh, left-leaning parliamentarians in the region and a lot of leading economists, were. We're not very excited about the TPP. Nonetheless, the idea of Trump getting rid of the TPP, which was appealing to the base, including labor unions in the United States and some Democrats, um, or actually majority of Democrats for that matter, left-leading Democrats, um, that was seen as something huge for America in terms of loss, like the U.S. has nothing to put forward. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at in terms of military strategic pushback, under Trump, you see more regular and frequent freedom of navigation operations. Now, the freedom of navigation operations uh, in a way, it's hypocritical because the U.S., it's essentially about the U.S. maintaining its hegemony in this part of the world, meaning American warships and aircraft carriers can roam those waters anytime they want, right? Nonetheless, it's something we're used to. We're used to already one bully in the town. Having two bullies, that's not what we're used to. And the problem is that the second bully, which is China, doesn't only want to have freedom of movement in the area. It's claiming 85% of that water as it's extended, essentially, territory or blue national soil. So we'd rather have someone like U.S. 
which is a much more benign bully than China, which is claiming the entire yard, right? Or 85% of that through the nine dash line. So the freedom of navigation operation, which is about challenging China's uh, claims, excessive claims within the nine dash line, including around uh, the artificial islands, this geoengineering miracle that they have been pulling off since 2013, and they have been militarizing since 2016 and 17 through the deployment of service to air missiles and ballistic missiles. That freedom of navigation operation is much more frequent under President Trump. It's not only much more frequent, it's much more expansive, including in areas which are claimed by the Philippines, like the Scarborough Shoal, which is very, very critical, uh, because if China builds military facilities there, it will be very close, close to Subic and Clark, where America still has military access, and this was the site of biggest American overseas bases in the past. And uh, President Trump has doubled uh, foreign military financing to countries like the Philippines. Again, uh, the, the Trump administration also, in addition to reg uh, regularizing freedom navigation operations, has also deployed now the U.S. Coast Guard uh, to the region. So now you have both the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard roaming those waters, challenging China's, uh, helping their allies. And uh, last year, interestingly, the United States it was even more clear about the parameters of its mutual defense treaty with countries, again, like the Philippines. I mean, I'm talking more about the Philippines because I'm from there, but I can talk about the region more. And this is important because my agreement with President Duterte, and perhaps one reason I was a bit popular among Duterte supporters at least at first was, I believe it was important to, uh, you know, essentially reset the tone with China, uh, with the United States also for that matter, because I felt that the Philippines was taken granted by the U.S. and the U.S. was having an open-ended relationship with the Philippines while the Philippines was feeling that we were in essentially a, uh, a marriage, an alliance with the U.S. So they were always ambivalent, and, and including President Obama on multiple occasions, about what is this mutual defense treaty relevance to the disputes in the South China Sea. But Secretary Pompeo, last March when he visited the Philippines, he made it very clear. If Filipino aircrafts, warships, and soldiers come under attack, specifically in the South China Sea, and this is clarification at a very high level, cabinet senior level, then the Mutual Defense Treaty will apply. And then more interestingly, in June last year, when a suspected Chinese militia force vessel hit a Filipino uh, fishing boat and killed almost 22 fishermen, Sung Kim, the, the American ambassador uh, to the Philippines, in, uh, interestingly, he was also a North Korean negotiator, so he's doing simultaneous jobs at the same time, a very adept diplomat of Korean origin, he said, that the Mutual Defense Treaty could also apply to so-called gray zone operation, meaning China's usage of non-conventional forces, including these paramilitary militia forces. So on many fronts, the Trump administration has been much more reassuring to the region in terms of its military commitment to its allies, in terms of directly confronting China. And, you know, a lot of countries are criticizing Trump for being, uh, let's just say, inelegant in terms of his rhetoric and sometimes even sloppy and infantile in terms of his method uh, but at least someone is talking about China's abusive and, and I would say mercantilist industrial and trade policy, which has definitely been hitting a lot of countries across the region. Uh, of course, Japan and South Korea, the more industrialist ones have been hurt hard. But, you know, China has been also taking away low end manufacturing from a lot of Southeast Asian countries. And they have been dumping a lot of their products, subsidized products. Uh, to the detriment of industries. Again, going back to the Philippines, we used to have a very robust, you know, Italian-esque uh, shoe industry in a city called Marikina. That place is totally dead. It's completely deindustrialized because China has been dumping extremely cheap products uh, below market prices. So, you know, yes, our trade with China is increasing, but we're also losing a lot of our productive industrial capacity. Uh, so Trump is pushing back also to the trade war. We may not agree with his method, but he's highlighting an important issue, which is China's predatory trade practices, not to mention also pushing back on the debt trap policy, so-called, of China under the Belt and Road Initiative. And that has emboldened some of the regional states and leaders, including, ironically, someone I interviewed last year and someone we know very well as anti-Western, Prime Minister Mahathir Mohammed of Malaysia, to come out very strong and push back against China and say, we don't want these infrastructure investments where it's all Chinese money, it's all Chinese workers done under very shadowy uh, uh, circumstances with very high interest rates. This is going to bury our countries in debt. That's unacceptable. So you have this kind of, uh, I would say, unintended coordination between the United States 
and some of the regional states led by very independent leading leaders like Mahathir, who are also very concerned about China's economic diplomacy in this part of the world. And that is where I feel that President Trump, you know, is at the very least, like a lot of populists around the world, raising at least the right questions. And I would even go so far as to say sometimes his answers are at least half sensible at most. Because I believe a lot of experts just see Trump as a complete wreck. And I feel the situation is much more complicated than that. And we know, by the way, Trump may be horrible himself. Uh, I'm not a fan of the person. But there are also many competent people within this administration that we don't hear much about because they're not as scandalous and controversial as those who have been kicked out or those we hear a lot about. And interestingly, I know for a fact that uh, people like, for instance, uh, Mr. Lifeizer, who's the chief trade negotiator of the United States, is ironically very popular among left-leaning folks in the United States because they believe finally there's someone in the U.S. government who is giving it to the Chinese, right, who have also deindustrialized huge parts of America because of their predatory trade and industrial policy. So, yeah, I mean, maybe some of these people don't want to be painted with the same brush uh, as Trump has. Um, so you mentioned the Belt and Road, and I wanted to so move on to China, focusing a little yeah. bit. Uh, and in your book, you've written that, you know, infrastructure development has become the new pivot of geopolitics and that the Belt and Road or, or BRI is about the inter internal economic balancing of China and the expansion of strategic presence across vital resource rich geographies. And it may even have a final price tag, some say, as high as eight trillion dollars. Um, and so, you know, there's this Chinese world order now. You cite Lee Kuan Yew in saying China is the biggest player in the history uh, of the world. Yet at the same time, you know, so there's this image of China as this, you know, powerful dragon rising, this this new empire. Uh, but you also have some doubts in your book. You're sometimes skeptical of the 21st century being the Chinese century. And you, you say, you know, as you mentioned, there's been a resurgence under Trump of the U.S. empire. Um, and you cite Michael Beckley in making the case that China's net power is still far behind the U.S. and that China is approaching the peak of both its economic and geopolitical power. Uh, and you've also compared Belt and Road to the American Transcontinental Railway bonanza. So, you know, can you tell us a little bit about this I mean, what, which figure is the, the, the correct way to see to see China, this this behemoth that's rising or, or paper tiger or somewhere the truth is somewhere in the middle? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is what I'm trying to do in this book and a lot of my recent writings is that I'm trying to show that there are there are vulnerable vulnerabilities with the United States. It's not a completely benign power. Uh, including here in Southeast Asia, it has a very dark history in places like the Philippines, which, peop which people like Duterte, you know, have uh, correctly and legitimately highlighted, uh, including our forgotten revolution against the Americans in the early uh, 20th century, when, when they stole our revolution and independence away by striking a deal behind our backs with the Spanish. So, you know, they have done a lot of shenanigans in this part of the, the world. Uh, but the question is, so should we suddenly be excited about the rise of China? And whether China is a viable alternative, are we suddenly going to shift from uh, the eagle to the dragon? And that's where also I have my doubts based on, you know, data and figures we're talking about here. And of course, interviews with senior policymakers and heads of states around the world, including senior policymakers in Beijing. The title of the book suggests that I'm really looking at the U.S.-China competition and uh, I'm looking at whether we're going to stay with uh, the hegemony of America, the eagle, or we're going to see the replacement of that by the hegemony of the dragon. But what I try to do in almost 400 pages is to show it's much more complicated than that. And in fact, towards the end of the book, I show that actually it, it's possible that within a generation of two, none of those will be the case, right? And I'll talk about uh, rhizomatic order, but let's leave that later on. Uh, my point is that there are clear vulnerabilities uh, with uh, American superpower position, and it doesn't help that they have a tempestuous uh, leader like Trump which sometimes is, uh, you know, glass more uh, empty than full, right? And we see that more and more as we uh, get to the end of hopefully his first term in office, but who knows? Uh, uh, so, uh, we see more of that as we see the end of his potentially just first term in office. Uh, but the thing is, when it comes to China also, the situation is also not very straightforward. Uh, as much as America has vulnerabilities, China also is a very fragile super superpower, as Susan Shirk would put it. Uh, and if you look at China, 
I think one of the biggest problems we have is our epistemolo epistemology of power. How do we measure power? You know, what do we know about power? And I think a lot of people, whether media uh, personalities, influencers and experts, they look at gross uh, resources of a country, uh, literally gross national product or your total budget, military budget or your total population or research and development fund. But I think a lot of experts, more uh, circumspect uh, and perspicuous experts like Michael Beckley, for instance, have been writing on this uh, in two important works, his international security article in 2012, uh, essentially, Will This Be a Chinese Century? And then uh, uh, his, uh, a book that he also released uh, more recently. When he talks about the resilience of American power, in a sense that you have to look at net power. So what is net power? Essentially, asset minus liabilities. And this is where China is not as powerful as many people think. So as much as China has a lot of resources uh, to dispose externally, it has even more li liabilities at home. We know that this is a country moving towards demographic winter by 2024. This is a country with one of the worst ecological uh, problems and predicaments among any major country in the world, among the most polluted cities in the world. Uh, this is a country that is yet to develop a significant uh, welfare system as the country ages. And, you know, just the physics of uh, economics is going to kick in soon as China will even inevitably structurally slow down. In fact, you know, as someone who travels sometimes three continents in a week, you know, you can always get a sense of how fast a, a place is growing by just visiting it. And, you know, like you visit Manila, you can feel this is a country of 67 percent growth. You can feel it. You go to Brazil, you know, it's one to two percent. You go to Turkey, you know, it's four percent, three percent. You don't get a sense of five, six, seven percent growth when you're in Shanghai or Beijing. Maybe they're growing 10, 15, 20 percent in some rural, far distant area. But in the major industrial zones of China, the Pearl River Delta, you're definitely seeing slowdown. And there are big questions about the reliability of Chinese numbers. So China is already slowing down and that slowdown will be more and more significant. This is a country that was growing 12 to 14 percent half a generation ago. And now they're supposedly growing at six to seven percent. But some believe it's even lower than that, three to four percent, which is not bad for a country with a per capita of around ten thousand dollar, a country as large as China. But China has hundreds of millions of people close to the poverty line. Sure, they have lifted six hundred million people within a generation out of extreme poverty. But still, you have a lot of people close to poverty line. A lot of my colleagues and friends in China, you know, especially in big cities, they cannot afford apartments. You know, apartments rent is five, six, seven hundred dollars, and they, their earnings for five hundred, six hundred dollars. So the average living standards in China are relatively low and significantly lower compared to a place like the United States. Now, if you look at key indicators, like for instance, per capita income, you're not. U.S. still has around six to seven times higher per capita income than China. If you look at biotechnology patents, U.S. is still way ahead of China. If you look at, for instance, Nobel laureate numbers, a lot of them, I think uh, perhaps Berkeley and San Francisco area has more Nobel laureates than entire China. Uh, if you look at, for instance, a lot of cutting edge industries, civilian and especially military, U.S. is at least a generation ahead of China. And in terms of China's gross uh, national product, with the U.S. now growing at 2 to 3 percent, it can match China's growth of around 4 or 5, 6 percent because U.S. GDP is in nominal terms 30 to 40 percent larger. So you cannot compare the two countries. First of all, one is developed and one is developing. Another country is still larger. So even at a slower growth, it can create more additional wealth than China. These are things that people are not looking at, including in the United States, to my shop. But more important, the U.S. with a smaller population and more uh, high quality human capital, more developed infrastructure and welfare is in a better position to have a uh, net, meaning uh, surplus materials to deploy in moments of war, right? Not to mention America is a significantly rich country in terms of natural resources and strategic resources and doesn't have any hostile neighbors, Canada and Mexico, compared to China, which is surrounded by a lot of rivals. So if you look, really look at net powers, uh, China is behind U.S. It's only in one area when China is catching up pretty fast, and I think Kai Fu Li, uh, the guy who made the Siri has written extensively on that. Very interestingly, he talks about artificial intelligence. He breaks it down to, I think, six or seven dimensions. And U.S. and China essentially have three, each of them, right? But in the dimensions where China is strong, these are dimensions whereby you are essentially talking about just having scale of data. So China is good in terms of surveillance AI because there's no privacy in China and you can survey 
one billion people unrestricted. So that gives you competitive advantage. But there are other aspects of AI whereby you need research and innovation, and it remains to be seen if China can keep up, right? And we know China has been also catching up in other areas, partly because of espionage and technological theft outright, right? Corporate espionage backed up by state. Nonetheless, the Chinese are still way behind U.S. But the second factor is that the U.S. doesn't have 100% reliable allies, but it has allies who are reliable from the range of 20% to 70 80%. So you can go from, you know, a country like, uh, let's say, Egypt uh, and Saudi Arabia all the way to more reliable allies, let's say, like Japan or Australia uh, or some of the Western European countries, especially uh, Britain, right? China, who are allies of China and how reliable are they? You know, I was in uh, North Korea uh, the other year, and it was very interesting in my discussions with North Korean officials. One of the things I noticed that they never said anything positive about China. And the other thing I noticed is that they seem very much obsessed with circumventing the China channel to directly deal with U.S. Remember, North Korea's ideology is juche, self-sufficiency. The fact that 90 percent of their trade goes through China alone it's a humiliation of North Koreans. So this is a clear case of uh, you know, animosity being even stronger among brothers and cousins, right? And that is why they were very excited to reach out to Southeast Asians from Philippines, Thailand, among others, because actually in the past, when you know sanctions were not as severe, North Korea could do a lot of shenanigans and illegal deals and trade via Southeast Asian countries as a diversification strategy away from China. And even if you go to Pakistan, which is supposed to be the other ally of China, this is a country that has been crumbling under Chinese debt and, you know, recently asked for IMF to bail them out, which was interesting. And the IMF, of course, which is controlled by the U.S. and Europeans, said, I'm not sure we want to bail you out from your Chinese debt, right? So Imran Khan had to go and ask help from uh, no less than MBS in Saudi Arabia to help him out. And he's also tried to be nice to Iranians. So even Pakistan, you know, supposed to be the all-weather friend of China is not as reliable as what we think. And these are also very domestically fragile countries or isolated countries we're talking about. And who else is left? Cambodia or Laos? So if you compare the range of partnerships and alliances, and yes, with varying degrees of reliability of the United States, not to mention their military bases all over Asia and in the Pacific region, and compare that to China with their only overseas base in Djibouti, for instance, and semi-base access from Bandar Abbas in Iran all the way to Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, among others, you're, you're looking at even larger asymmetry than I was mentioning a while ago. And the other thing is that, you know, middle powers like Japan and India, for instance, may not be yes man to the U.S., especially Indians, who are still, you know, non-aligned movement, but they themselves are very worried about China, and they themselves have significant resources of their own. Japan still is considered to have the most advanced navy in Asia and among top five in the world. In some way, even put it in top four, top three in the world. It still has the third largest economy in the world. People are counting out Japan as if Japan is gone, but they're still third largest. And by far, Japan is the largest investor in inf infrastructure in Southeast Asia, way larger than China. And I'm talking about new investments. If you look at net stock of investment, China is a negligible country because they used to be way poorer in the past, while Japan has been industrializing and developing Southeast Asian countries since essentially the end of Second World War. Right. And the Asian Development Bank, which is headquartered in Manila, is essentially Japan dominated. So we're, let's not count on Japan. And India is the other major power rising up. Now, India is still a poor country. It has a lot of domestic problems, but their naval prowess should not be underestimated. And then you have even Europeans coming to the picture, the French, the British, even the Germans at some point were flirting with the idea of doing their freedom of navigation or access operations in the Taiwan Straits in the South China Sea. So when you put all of these elements together, China doesn't seem to be the very domineering uh, country or power, as many people uh, think. You know, I come from a country whose icon is Manny Pacquiao, you know, a boxing icon. And we'll say that if this is a boxing match, probably we're not going to have a knockout anytime soon. And we're only round four. And China in round four is already showing uh, vulnerabilities, even though it started round one and two as a very promising young, uh, you know, lad coming to the match, right? So uh, this is what we're looking at right now, fragility of China. And the other thing we're looking at is that smaller powers, relatively smaller powers, are also pushing back. So I mentioned a while ago with, with Mahathir's case, openly questioning the Belt and Road Initiative. And then that had a multiplier effect, because if you have someone like Mahathir with his profile, someone known as anti-Western, now, going in Beijing in the Great Walls, People's Hall, saying we have to be worried about new colonialism inside China, 
then that gave a lot of credibility to people who were criticizing the Belt and Road Initiative as a death trap diplomacy. Now, I, I show in the book that the death trap narrative is unfair, it's lopsided, it is applicable in limited cases in countries with very questionable sovereign debt, uh, uh, with very questionable, uh, you know, sovereign uh, credit uh, uh, prerogative and strength. Let's say Pakistan, let's say Laos, uh, Montenegro, for instance. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Malaysia was the first really developed, more, more or less mid-sized power who came out and said, even us, we are vulnerable. So that immediately gave a wake-up call to people, including in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and other countries who were saying, wait, if even Malaysia is vulnerable, then maybe we have to think twice about it. And I remember when Matir was here in Manila and I talked to him about this issue, the presidential palace of President Duterte had to respond right away and to say, oh, we're, we're different from Malaysia, you know? So everyone became very defensive. And in fact, Matir met Imran Khan. They had a discussion about how, you know, BRI trapped countries can help each other. So you have also smaller countries fighting back. And in the South China Sea, I think China has really overplayed its card. I think China thought that it could just co-opt the elites in the region and essentially buy its way out on sovereignty, sensitive sovereign issues by pledges of economic investments, because a lot of Chinese investments are more pledges than reality. I mean, the Philippines were yet to see a single major Chinese infrastructure investment kicking in. This is under no less than Duterte, who's the most pro-China leader you can imagine. He should get the gold medal for loyalty. Uh, perhaps Hun Sen just comes next, uh, you know, Hun Sen of Cambodia. Um, so even in smaller South Asian countries, you are seeing this pushback. In the South China Sea, you know, my predictions and analysis are bearing even more true. Uh, last December, out of nowhere, I was I, in Hainan, China, and President Xi Jinping just launched the, um, uh, I was in Sanya, where President Xi Jinping launched the Shandong aircraft carrier, their first ever indigenous aircraft carrier. There was a lot of festivity, and then suddenly the mood was souring, and the Chinese diplomats and friends were talking and say, what do you think about Malaysia, which suddenly submitted its extended continental sh tail shelf claim at the United Nations? So now Malaysia is directly challenging China's claims in the central regions of South China, including the Spratlys by taking the case to United Nations. And when China criticized that, guess what did Malaysia do? Malaysia said, Nine Dash Line is ridiculous, and then invoked the Philippines Arbitration Award in 2016 to say, see, your Nine Dash Line is not valid. So while Duterte himself is not you know, asserting the, Nine Dash, uh, the Arbitration Award, other countries like Malaysia are doing that. And then boom, Indonesia in the past few weeks has also upped the ante. President Jokowi even visited the Natuna area and said, this is ours, de jure de facto, no question about it. And the Chinese ambassador had to be very defensive about this issue because of the intrusion of Chinese uh, fishing vessels and Coast Guard forces in the Natuna Island, which is close to the tip of the Nine Dash Line of China. So suddenly, even Indonesia has a stake in the South China Sea disputes because of the extensive nature, in fact, excessive nature of China's claims. So I think China has been overplaying its card. And if you look at history, you shouldn't be surprised because... Yes, maybe in some ways China has advantages because they can have long-term decision-making process, their authoritarian system. I have a lot of respect for President Xi Jinping, in, uh, at least in terms of his you know, dedication to his country, among other things. Uh, but the reality is that China, if you look at thousand years of history of China over the past thousand years, this is not the most successful civilization when it comes to strategy. After all, how many centuries out of a millennia has China been in control of itself? Uh, the, you know, the Manchus were in control of China for 300, 400 years. The Mongolians were there for 100, 200 years. Then you had 100 years of humiliation. So probably China was in control of itself, meaning Han Chinese were in control of China for barely a third of the past thousand years. Right? Um, and some of that was even under the rule of warlords. So it was even an anarchic situation. So China is not necessarily the most sophisticated country. And I think the other problem I see with China is despite the really huge strides they've made in area specialization, in sending out scholars, in inviting our scholars to China, I think it still remains a tone-deaf country when it comes to understanding the sensitivity of smaller countries. Um, I, I, I cite Edvard Lutvak, uh, among other experts, uh, and of course, Kosikan Bilahari, a Singaporean diplomat also, uh, I think, used that. Uh, he, he, he talks about great power autism. It's very politically incorrect term, but essentially his idea is that uh, China and U.S. also for that matter, especially under Trump, are just essentially uh, emotionally you know, blind right, to the realities of smaller countries. You know, whenever I'm with my Chinese friends, they always say you have to respect the sentiments of the Chinese people. 
Well, guess what? You have to also respect the sentiments of 270 million Indonesians, of 108 million Filipinos, and 100 million very angry Vietnamese who are not very happy with China. So you have hundreds of millions of Southeast Asians who are increasingly proud of their countries, and these are also rising economies, emerging markets. Uh, Indonesia is already a G20 economy. Philippines and Vietnam are going to be there in the coming decades. These countries are not also pushovers. Maybe Duterte seems like a pushover, but not the Philippine military, which is very close to China, uh, very close to U.S. Uh, I'll try to end on this point by saying, like, the limit of China's influence is also very clear, especially in places like the Philippines, for instance. Duterte has gone the extra mile to welcome China, but up until today, the Philippine military, which has maintained strong ties with the U.S., has refused to sign a single defense agreement with China, major defense agreement. While with the United States, last year alone, there were 300, close to 300, joint military exercises, including joint war games in the South China Sea with China as a potential enemy. This was more than any other Indo-Pacific partner of the United States. And this is happening under Duterte's watch. I don't think it's because Duterte is trying to play both sides. It's more like Duterte cannot control the Philippine military because the Philippine military is essentially a veto player when it comes to the country's defense policy. So you see the resilience of American institutional ties and strategic influence in this part of the world. So to end on, on that question, yes, China's influence is rising. Duh, it's just a big country. It's the biggest country in this part of the world. But is the influence rising to a point that it reaches a critical mass whereby it Finlandizes neighboring countries and can dictate their foreign defense policy? I don't think so. And if you see anything, it's fluidity, resistance, and backlash, despite all the nice things and conviviality of the rhetoric between Chinese leaders and some of the Southeast Asian uh, leaders, some of them, in fact, completely co-opted by China. And so we've looked at both the U.S. and China and one of the biggest themes of your book is that the future will be kind of middle of the road where the middle powers, a lot of which you've, you've mentioned, are going to shape uh, things to come. I think we'll see a lot of this, these regional integration, this regionalism uh, setting, setting the tone, uh, as well as, you know, towards the end of the book, you mentioned you know, some of the things that can go wrong. You cite Graham Allison and the Thucydides trap, um, and then finally you end with, uh, before we m even get to you know World War III, we might have an uh, environmental uh, apocalypse. But you know, looking at this idea of the Thucydides trap, um, you know, this is one of the mega regions you say where the next world war could be ignited. And there's you know many hot hot spots, flashpoints: South China Sea, uh, North Korea, Taiwan. I mean, y you name it. But um, and also we know the U.S. military and Navy. Perhaps uh, they've made the Indo-Pacific their priority theater. They've renamed um, the Pentagon command structure from I think Asia Pacific to Indo Pacific recently and and you, but you write that China's military gap with the U.S. is is huge and won't catch up perhaps for another decade or or two which is why I personally don't think that you know we'll be close to war anytime soon you know perhaps 2030 2040 2050 I mean if it comes to that it'll it'll kind of be like a century ago you know kind of mimicking World War II um, but most people don't want war but we know there are always some crazy hawks among the leadership of different countries who, who, who do want war so uh, what are your thoughts on the potential for conflict between the two powers in the Thucydides trap? Right even though my writings and you know kind of like Hegel I'm, I'm trying to keep on writing working out the same argument over and over in, in different books so if you look at my a previous book of mine back in 2015, Asia's New Battlefield, that's what I call the South China Sea in the Western Pacific. I was already making these arguments and I'm, I'm, keep, I'm, I'm trying to keep on developing it over the years with more materials and data and, you know, back, uh, exchanges with people who are really in the know and making the decisions in this part of the world. Uh, the thing is, you know, before talking about what are the real challenges down the road, the reality is that things could still go very wrong in the short to medium run uh, between the United States and China with very horrific implications. Uh, I would say that uh, on a global scale, China is way behind the United States on a one-to-one -one basis, military-wise, U.S. is still way ahead of China in terms of uh, the quality and sometimes even the volume of its, you know, like, for instance, number of aircraft carriers of U.S. compared to China uh, or advanced warships, among uh, others. Um, but 
if it's if, if it's a war within China's backyard, obviously China has advantages, and that's where it can deploy, similar to Iran, but on a far larger scale, essentially Iranian asymmetrical warfare on steroids. That's what China can deploy, including uh, their Dofang, you know, anti-cruise ballistic missiles. So China can really give America blood in nose and, you know, perhaps claim some American aircraft carriers in an event of war. But we know, you know, going back to Antonio Gramsci, the great uh, Italian Marxist thinker, you know, power... Uh, and hegemony is not about uh, capturing power per se. Uh, he makes a distinction between war of position and war of maneuver. Everyone talks about war, right? And war is the war of maneuver situation. But what everyone is doing is the war of positioning, right? So China is trying to surround the area and put weapons and on and influence the elites. The United States is trying to counter that. So everyone's trying to avoid the maneuver situation by strengthening their position, right? So it's kind of like go versus chess which is like elimination of each other. So it's strategic encirclement, encirclement and counter encirclement. At the same time, we know based on First World War, right? And uh, I talk about Guns of August, which I think is the best classic work uh, as far as the origins of the war is concerned, is that you can actually essentially sleepwalk into war. And First World War is a war of cousins. I mean, you know, just how shocking it could be, right? You know, our Tsar in uh, Tsar Nicholas in Russia, uh, our, uh, you know, and, and his cousin in Britain, and then Wilhelm, another cousin in Germany, and yet all of them were you know, at war. And actually, it started with one great power going against a smaller power, the region you're familiar with, right? Uh, in the Balkans, right? And then it got out of control. And so you could imagine the Iran situation could be similar, whereby a superpower goes against a regional power or a smaller power, and then other great powers coming in. But before going to that issue, the fact of the matter is that the same thing had also happened in Southeast Asia, whereby smaller powers, this was in fact the fear back during the Aquino administration that, you know, more zealous anti-China regional leaders will drag America into war against China. That's why Obama was very circumspect, I think overly circumspect. And then Trump comes in, but Philippines suddenly flips over, has a different kind of uh, a leader who's now leaning towards China more than the United States, in fact, hostile to the United States. But this is where the parameters of U.S.-China competition are most lucid and prominent, and uh, it, we have a potential tinderbox here, right? That's why South China Sea, we have to really think about it. That's why I've been obsessing about it. I've been writing about this for the past 10 years. I spent some time in the Middle East. So I, I want to make sure in my own little ways that South China Sea doesn't become another Persian Gulf, right? Uh, nonetheless, the fact of the matter is that even if we avoid a superpower war or conflict in the South China Sea, down the road, there are bigger challenges. And these challenges are just so huge and all encompassing that neither China nor US and perhaps even together those two countries will be you know important enough and sufficient enough in terms of the resources to deal with these challenges. So I talk about the twin challenges of climate change and artificial intelligence. Uh, these are tra non-traditional security challenges or sometimes not even a non-traditional security challenge that are going to be almost traditional because of their depth and because of their gravity in the coming decades. Mm -hmm. The thing is like in the final chapter of the book uh, I come with this kind of a morbid line, uh, and uh, uh, my argument there essentially is that some countries are going to die before they get rich, right? So there's this uh, term that some countries are going to get old before they get rich. Uh, if you look at a country like Bangladesh, it may not be around in three generations from now. If you look at the trends in climate change and the potential impact on sea levels, and major cities like Jakarta, Manila, Bangkok, uh, Mumbai, are going to be in big, big trouble in the decades to come, right? And huge parts of uh, Middle East, the Persian Gulf, are going to be effectively uninhabitable with degrees of 70, 80 degrees uh, centigrade no? uh, uh, within a century. So we're talking about a climate uh, apocalypse in many ways, and that's increasingly being borne by science and the data that we're gathering uh, regardless of what Trump and, you know, some of the climate change deniers believe in this is going to happen. Um, and, and, and of course, if you look at surveys, uh, in, in 10 countries that are most vulnerable and, and most exposed, so exposure is just it happens to you, and vulnerable means how, how prepared you are. Uh, countries like the Philippines and Indonesia and Pakistan, they, in, they constantly come up. So Indo-Pacific is home to more than half of the countries who are going to be most affected by the climate change. So these are the challenges that we are facing. That's why 
you know, it's good to think about, for instance, the movie 2012, whereby suddenly China saves the world, right? So you have to see China not only as an enemy, but also as a potential source of assistance for the non-traditional security threats that are going to be more apocalyptic in decades to come. I also talk about artificial intelligence because studies show, for instance, the International Labor Organization study shows that 56% of jobs, especially manufacturing low-end jobs, are going to get disappear. Uh, they're going to disappear in places like Cambodia, Philippines, Indonesia. Now, maybe you can create new jobs, like how Uber is creating new jobs, but the quality of these jobs, uh, the lack of tenure in this job is going to create more and more psychological stress and grievance and what Nietzsche called ressentiment, right? Uh, got, he got it from Rousseau. And that ressentiment could feed all sorts of nasty political movements, from ISIS and Daesh all the way to right-wing populism and all sorts of reactionary political movements. So it's those kinds of disasters and challenges that we have to prepare for down the road. And this is where I say, not only in terms of epistemology of power, meaning how you measure power, but ontology of power, the very nature of power, we have to also have reconsideration. I believe that when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, we should no longer talk about what you know scientists call aboreal, hierarchical power. Who's at the top of you know, pecking order, right? China or US? No. Down the road, the challenges are so multifarious and so overwhelming that we should look at power actually as much more uh, uh, rhizomatic. It's just like how the plants grow laterally without direction, without any kind of center or core. And in fact, it's very possible that's going to be the case down the road. Let's say climate change crisis and wildfires in Australia or tsunamis in Indonesia. At some point, Indonesia and Australia could be more relevant to dealing with this climate change in tandem together. There are going to be cases where U.S. is too far away to be even relevant at all in dealing with problems like uh, environmental dislocation, uh, labor market dislocation because of the artificial intelligence and all different ways that AI could actually go wrong in terms of managing our data, our privacy and our state institutions because they're, they're more and more uh, dependable on that and hence they're more and more susceptible to either big brother situation or hack. So what I'm trying to portray there is that the challenges that are coming the winter is coming, and that winter is going to make all of our little wars here and our little kingdoms really relevant. So there's definitely a Game of Thrones reality there that we're actually ignoring. And this winter could be the longest winter in uh, in human history if we believe the science that, as so far as we have, as imperfect as that science had, is. And if you look at the trends, which brings me to my final argument. Uh, my, my, well, I would say my central argument. This book is neither a, a praise of the United States nor just portrayal of China as an evil and enemy we have to fight against. What I'm arguing here is that A, China is too big to be contained. They're just so integral to global economy that containment strategy like George Kennan's of the 20th century is just nonsensical because Soviet Union was never as integral to global economy and just sheer size and contribution and innovation of China makes it a completely different species. Uh, it's perhaps the real rival to United States superpower in the past 150 years that we can imagine. So we're talking about a completely different species here. Uh, but China can be constrained, which is very different from containment. And this is a term I got from Gerard Segal, a Canadian political scientist. And his idea is that through coordinated and coherent pushbacks, diplomatic, uh, economic, including trade war, one of, the, one of the things that perhaps Trump is doing, but the more sophisticated version, perhaps, a more coordinated version, because the problem with Trump is that he's pissing off everyone instead of creating a coalition of like-minded countries to pressure China. For instance, he could do it together with Japan and EU, but he's not doing that. He's pissing off everyone, threatening everyone's tires. So he's doing a very sloppy job. But a smarter administration could have done a coordinated pressure effort against China on industrial and trade policy, and also military pushback, including increasing military footprint of not only U.S., but other like-minded countries, and also the capabilities of smaller countries to defend themselves. That's why capacity building is even more important than U.S. coming in. Better U.S. help Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia stand on their own, including also Vietnam, than they coming and doing the war for us. We don't want also that situation. Because I believe, and this is what I think even recent history shows, even under Xi Jinping, that when China faces concerted pushback, it recalibrates. We saw that clearly when China had to cancel or concede and make major concessions when Mahathir went strong against China on the BRI issue. In fact, so strong that later on China, during the second Belt and Road Initiative uh, summit last May in Beijing, President Xi Jinping suddenly talked about the need for sustainability, debt sustainability, environmental sustainability. So suddenly now we're talking about BRI 2.0. 
because China saw a pushback, so now they adjust. We saw exactly the same thing when China was proposing the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which everyone thought China is going to have complete veto on all important decisions. When there was pushback for two and a half years, they recalibrated and they for, for they did forego a lot of veto powers. So that's why eventually Britain and other countries joined. In the South China Sea, you can always say, well, Richard, you're talking about economics, but geopolitics is very different. Guess what? In the South China Sea, I'll talk about two other important instances. One instance is that China dropped the term nine dash line from its formal positions, formal uh, statements when the Philippine Arbitration Award came out. So while China said that, oh, it's a piece of trash paper, blah, 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 they actually recalibrated their position and they came out with alternative documents, including Forsha. They said they have a new map, et cetera. But they realized you cannot completely ignore international law. You can pretend that you ignore it. You can try to do what you're trying to do, but definitely China realized that there, there's going to be a cost if they continue to raise the nine dash line claim, right? But more importantly, China never clarified the exact coordinates of nine dash line. You know, that tongue, that cow tongue shape claim, uh, you know, eating into 85% of the South China Sea Basin, because they always want to reserve a room for making adjustments. If down the road, they have to make that adjustments. So China is uh, consciously reserving room for adjustment and recalibration. And that is why my contention is that we have, when I say we, smaller neighboring countries and other middle powers, if we can get our act together and have coherent and, and sincere pushback and make it also crystal clear to China that we also have our domestic politics, we also have our national sen uh, sensitivities, and we have our legitimate interests and we're willing to fight for it, then China is will uh, willing to recalibrate. Oh, so we can check China's worst instincts if we can get our act together. That is the argument I've been making. And I think uh, whether China moving out of the Natuna area when Jokowi came in, whether China, uh, you know, getting out of the Vanguard Bank when the Vietnamese stood up, whether it's about, you know, the Chinese making huge concessions to Malaysia when Malaysia's, when, when Mahathir stood up to them on the BRI, we see that even on the bilateral basis, when the smaller country stands up, China is willing to recalibrate. Uh, and that is because China wants authority and influence. And authority and influence doesn't come only with hard power. It doesn't also come only with sharp power, which is interference in the domestic affairs of more democratic countries through disinformation and elite cooptation, among others. But ultimately, it comes with a degree of trust and respect. And if there's no trust and respect for China, if China continues to erode that, down the road, once you show vulnerabilities, like vultures, they're going to take advantage of that. And if it reaches a certain dangerous threshold, some countries will be willing to hold their nose and even go with the U.S. And we already see intimations of that with Indonesia and Malaysia, who have been historically non-aligned country. And as Muslim countries, they're also very much concerned about what the Trump administration is doing in the Middle East. But at the same time, let's not forget, what's happening in Xinjiang is also pissing off a lot of Muslims, including an influential imam in Malaysia who said, we have to boycott Chinese products. Even Mahathir is speaking out on the Xinjiang and Uyghur issue. So China is alienating a lot of people. And you cannot just win over and bribe people through force and money. That's not going to work. You need their trust and you need their support. And American hegemony in this part of the world has shown more resilience, so much so that it's, it's surviving no less than the disastrous presidency of someone like Trump. So that tells you, about, that, that tells you a lot about the uphill battle for China for mastery or global mastery in the Indo-Pacific. And the fact of the matter is that we don't even know what China really wants. In fact, I even doubt that the Chinese themselves know what they want. Because as Marxists and as people who believe in, you know, uh, ancient Chinese wisdom, these people actually think in very dialectical terms. There's nothing fixed. As far as dialectic thinking is concerned, it's always a back and forth and it's mutually constitutive as the terms that social scientists and constructivists use. So what China wants will also depend on what we're willing to concede to them. And China will be willing to recalibrate their ambitions minus some core interests. And I think their core interest clearly is not non-disintegration of China, right? But anything beyond that, uh, dominating the South China Sea, dictating the policy of other countries, I think we have to make it clear to China that those are the luxuries that it cannot afford and there'll be a price and cost for that. So my aim with my writings 
Uh, and my message here is that let's help China to overcome its worst instincts. Because down the road, we need China, we need any help we can, because the winter is coming. And that's the twin challenge of artificial intelligence and climate change. That's a great place to, to end it. Um, also, because we've been cut off almost half a dozen times with our internet, although we both have high-speed internet, so I don't know what's going on. Um, it, could, going on. <laughs> it, could be, it could be just the literal, literal um, uh, winter we have today. Today in Kazakhstan, it's snowing a lot, and we oh, were actually... We were let go from work uh, early. It's not that cold yet, but big snow. So yeah, because in DC it was kind of hot. I mean, even in Tehran it was kind of hot. I suppose uh, it's not as in Istanbul was kind of hot. I think climate change is really there. I mean, yes, it was crazy. Anyways, amigo, please take care. Thank you very much. Muchas uh, gracias. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it's always it's always good to have a time to actually expand on things more, not just give three minutes sexy. A concise, you know, uh, catchy, headliney uh, analysis, but something that actually goes to the nuances of my work. So thank you very much. My pleasure. All right. That was our interview with Richard Haydarian. I hope you enjoyed it. You can support him by visiting his website, richardhaydarian.ph. Pick up a copy of his book, The Indo-Pacific, The New Struggle for Global Mastery. You can get the Kindle version or the physical copy. Check out his Twitter as well. It's a great resource. Visit us at geopoliticsandempire.com. You can subscribe to our email list, all of our social media. You can support us there and you can donate to us to keep us going with Bitcoin, PayPal, Patreon soon with Subscribestar as well as the Brave browser. See you on the next episode.